Thank you for tuning in to uh, Look Before You Speak. Uh, we have a very special guest today. Um, our, the program uh, has a very special or unique approach, uh, I believe, and commercial television often rotates through imagery very quickly, usually one to two seconds. You're able to take a look at an image and really contemplate what you're seeing. And it's kind of trained our mind's eye to to be really quick and, and uh, this program has a different approach in that we put images up before us and uh, allow them to uh, sit, rest there and uh, that we're able to talk about them and uh, really take our time in looking at them. And I think this is really important in uh, the world of art and, and uh, important for the dialogue in our community and we have so many gifted um, people and scholars here in the community. It's really great to bring people in who are accustomed to talking about art, uh, working with artists, and uh, both writing and uh, elucidating what the uh, art is, is about. Uh, our today's guest is a uh, professor of art at the University of Montana, Catherine Mallory, and she's also the uh, gallery uh, a visual arts director, and she teaches uh, professional practices uh, in instruction at the university. And I'm thrilled to have a curator on the program uh, who kind of uh, is the caretaker of ideas around the, the world of art, and I'm excited to bring, to see uh, what Catherine's brought in uh, as far as images. <laughs> So thanks for coming in Yeah, today. thank you very much, Steve. It's nice to be here. Yeah. So you brought some images in today of different artists or? Yeah, some past exhibits. Um, so first off, maybe I'll tell you that at the Gallery of Visual Arts at the university, it is the School of Arts Gallery. And so our mission is, of course, um, education related as all museums and galleries are mm -hmm. for the most part but so some of our exhibits are dedicated to our program with um, our degree requirements such as our Masters of Fine Arts program and our Bachelor of Fine Arts program and we also do faculty shows but then we also have a very active visiting artist program and when possible we try to bring those artists in for uh, an exhibit as well because we just feel the impact is so much stronger for our students. So I brought in a sampling of those kinds of exhibits to share with you today and um, one, of, one of the things I would just add to that is that the the gallery serves not only the campus but the community of Missoula really responds to the artists that you host and insight into new and up and coming artists in the community and so Absolutely. it's not just specifically education for uh, a limited number of people but it touches the community broadly yeah thank for thanks for bringing that up because <laughs> yeah. we are kind of sequestered in the middle of the campus and in the social science building and uh, so sometimes it is difficult for the community to find us but yes all of our events and programs we uh, invite the community so you're right it's it's actually for the the university the community and statewide so mm -hmm. Well, let's jump in and look at some images. Sounds you, great. Okay. Sounds great. Uh oh. So wow. the first image I'm I'm showing you today is from an exhibit called Changing Currents, and this was an exhibit that was based around the removal of the Milltown Dam, and it was wonderful because it was a collaboration between four institutions, the um, of course the Gallery of Visual Arts the Montana Museum of Art and Culture, which is also at the university, the Missoula Art Museum, and the Historical Museum at Fort Missoula. And so one of the things that I thought was really special about this exhibit was, um, of course, our collaboration. But as curators, recognizing this really significant event that was happening um, environmentally for our community, and looking for ways that we could get artists to comment about this. And so um, in the Gallery of mm -hmm. Visual Arts, 
this exhibit featured seven artists, and this particular image is from a Helena, Montana artist, Katie Knight. And so the exhibit, of course, was all based on themes of water, and so she used uh, fabrics, old recycled plastic, water bottles, things, and um, the gallery was painted a dark blue, and it was very mysterious, and, and really commenting um, a lot about our just our environment, the importance of water, and it was boat imagery, of course, colors relating to um, water, and it was really quite successful. Mm -hmm. And so the students at the university obviously are exposed to not just the form and the shape and the installation, but the fact that the artists were addressing specific social issues. Absolutely. <coughs> and, and so that's really important because artists, you know, Katie Knight is a, 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 a real strong activist. Uh, she currently teaches high school in Helena at um, Helena High and, at, and she also teaches at Carroll College and she's always been a big proponent of art as activism. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's really important for people to see how artists can comment and actually affect change. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. Yeah. So you brought so, another image? Yeah, actually. let's go to the next okay. image. <laughs> so uh, this artist, Erica Spitzer Rasmussen, she is from Minneapolis area, and she does um, garments made of very unlikely materials. And in fact, in this image, there's like, actual f dried fish skin, uh, dried apricots, horse hair. But she comments a lot on um, uh, issues of fertility, of, of gender, and of, of beauty. And so th this was a, an exciting show just for its use of materiality. And uh, <sighs> She was paired with another fiber artist, and although the university does not have a fibers program, it's really interesting how many students are just incorporating more and more fiber and just, just issues of materiality, I mm -hmm. guess. So mm -hmm. I felt this was a really inspiring exhibition for, mostly for its just innovative use of materials. So these artists actually um, take the initiative to contact you for exhibitions? And yeah, that works both ways. Some people will send proposals mm -hmm. uh, that are you know, expressing interest in uh, exhibiting or being a visiting artist in the School of Art. And then other times, as, as a curator, you know, when you travel and, and you, I'm always seeking out art and love to see what artists are doing in different regions of the country. And with Erica's work, I was actually in Minneapolis and saw an exhibition of her work and was very inspired by it and uh, contacted her. So, mm -hmm. so you must always have going through your mind, how can this potential artist be of uh, educational value? How can it touch your audience? Absolutely, and like I said with the, the past image with sort of re using relevance of what's going on, right, relating to something. And, and uh, one of our local treasures, Nancy Erickson, was going to be featured in, a, in you know, an honoree for the College of Visual and Performing Arts. And so I was looking really to sort of elevate the whole uh, sort of fiber art scene around her show so mm -hmm. here again tying into that mm -hmm. and also as a curator really trying to be conscious of giving diversity to our, our schedule and uh, you know not relying on personal bias but on just presenting really good work mm -hmm. well when I look at you know I saw the show and I just think you know, it worked on so many different levels. On the sculptural, yes, you talk about fiber and maybe mm -hmm. people aren't, um, students aren't 
oriented in a fiber specific way but the forms are incredibly strong it's really expressive and it has a great deal of content and I think those are uh, wonderful aspects about bringing something in that people aren't necessarily familiar with absolutely and <clears throat> and so actually I mean Materials run the gamut. Yeah. Everything is up for interpretation and for <laughs> use, right? <laughs> we love that. Let's so, look at another image. Sure, let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So, so this is an image uh, from one of our previous faculty exhibits, and the artist is Marianne Bongiorni. And this was a really fun exhibit for me to curate. I, I actually put forth a challenge to the faculty to think about the objects that they collect. Think about the creative process, how what they look at, what they collect, really informs the things that they make. And so the exhibit was titled Accumulation Transformation. And uh, Marianne Bongiorni uses many kitsch found objects in her work. And so she has shown this collection of trophies with her actual artwork in the background. And um, Marianne just recently had an exhibit at the Missoula Art Museum not too long ago. And that was traveling through the Montana Art Gallery Directors Association. And, and so all the artists in the exhibit had their own personal collection. Some chose to do an installation with their objects. Some just sh chose to show it as an actual object. And what I thought was really exciting about this approach to an exhibit was that it really was more about just sort of the internal creative process. Mm -hmm. What do artists think about? What do they look at? Um, how are they inspired? Uh, where do they borrow from culture? Mm -hmm. and, and so I felt that gave a whole different insight into the sort of final product or the art object. Yeah, and I think one of the things I enjoyed about the exhibit and the concept <coughs> is, uh, you know, artists take symbols and s symbology, say, Exam for example, the uh, trophies, mm. and reinvent them. And they have completely different meaning. And something that's really may have a particular meaning in a culture is utterly changed. And this has happened throughout history. It's not unique to our time. And, you know, you, you think of the African masks and Picasso and the modernists, and, and uh, some people are bothered by the stealing from other culture, maybe. But I just see it as reappropriation and reinvention, and that it is a natural aspect of creativity. Right, and it's, it's just that contextual association, right, by... by altering it and even somehow putting this on a pedestal even it just changes the context of mm -hmm. how we view it and you know many many artists use found objects found materials and I think it's great because it's a point of entry and a point of discovery and viewers might go wow that's a trophy or that's a toaster or whatever mm -hmm. but then mm -hmm. the way the artist has used it like you're saying, creates a whole new meaning that the viewer can dive into further and, um, and often it's ironic, sarcastic, humorous. Sure. Um, so definitely uh, another material that many artists use. And, well, that's great. And in fact, I believe the next image is an artist that's famous for, for d using the found object. <laughs> and... Um, this is an image from Francis Pearson, and Francis currently lives in Clinton, Montana. And these are life-size deer, and they are built out of found natural materials, found wood, various objects. And you can see that these three deer are also sitting on this sort of astroturf checkerboard uh, carpet, which 
maybe a comment on our urban deer situation. I don't <laughs> know. But um, these, uh, talk about his sense of discovery. These, I mean, he even created the antlers, so they're not found antlers. And there are, oh, croquet balls, cranks, uh, rusted objects, tools. And what I find fascinating about his work is, of course, the innovative use of materials, but it, it's hard to put that many kinds of materials together and have it be aesthetically sound, right? It can mm -hmm. get really chaotic mm -hmm. pretty mm -hmm. easily. And I think that Francis does a fabulous job of, of doing that, bringing things together, uh, commenting about really the landscape. And he talks a lot about uh, you know, he's an avid outdoorsman, he hunts, he fishes, and he talks about his work of trying to record the things that maybe aren't seen, mm -hmm. the things that we feel. So Yeah, I found this uh, exhibition really poetic, and it's not, I think the art world, what I think many people fail to understand, it's not about spelling everything out that the person who goes and looks at something needs to bring their own something of themselves to looking at the object. And, uh, and I think it's really, this exhibit was really successful in not spelling everything out. It's not necessar necessary to like hammer a particular message home. And, uh, and in that way, I think it's fantastic for students to be mm -hmm. exposed to that, you know, somebody who's really consistent on that level. Yeah, and I think many artists do that where they don't want to hammer you over the head. They, everyone certainly has their own opinions and their beliefs, but I think just throwing it out there, I, his work dealt with a lot of controversial environmental issues too. Like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, bringing back the wolf and mm -hmm. sort of th that controversy between ranchers and environmentalists and, and uh, but yet he did not express his stance. Mm -hmm. He threw it out mm -hmm. there for viewers to interpret and take what they will depending on their own yeah, experience. Yeah, and have a, have a uh -huh. dialogue about it in their own uh, world. Absolutely, and and this exhibit really incited a lot of conversation yeah. about that. I mean, here again, you know, I talked about sort of this point of entry to the work where you might recognize, oh, that's a shovel or that's a, you know, part of a, a gear or whatever. But then, then you start thinking about what else that could represent, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and so, yeah, it was a very successful exhibit and. Um, Really proud to say, too, that Francis went through the um, graduate program at the university 20 years ago, and so it's great to see him still producing work, and, you know, we're really proud of the students. We have some really good students, and many of them go on to teaching at universities, so, and I think many artists do become teachers, whether it's in a... Mm -hmm school system or not, it's just by throwing your work out there, you are asking questions of mm -hmm. the viewer and, you know, so you're a teacher indirectly or directly. That's correct. Yeah. And, and uh, I think just like this program, I mean, uh, taking a different approach about looking at art and uh, that it, and, you know, I think many people are kind of dismissive of art because they don't take the time to just look, not judge. I mean, judgments are, are natural, but just take the time to look and allow that to sink in, so, but anyway. No, and I think you're right. Many people, perhaps, that aren't used to looking at non-representational art or mm -hmm. whatever or they do well what's it supposed to be or what's it supposed to say and sometimes it's just about how it feels mm -hmm. and 
and you're right, if people will spend time with that, they're always going to go away with, with something. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Even if they adamantly dislike it, that is still a reaction. Yeah, sure. And, um, sure. But it's about not, not necessarily judging it, um, and, but just feeling it. Sure. Feeling it. Sure. sure. Well, it's about, there are so many different angles and ways to look at and appreciate art. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can be on the level of a narrative and story. And, and believe me, I think storytelling is alive and well in our culture. And, but, you know, there's, there are performance, poetry, visual arts where the, the only level that's achieved is an emotional one, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to relate to a story or a, f or a formal yeah. one. Or just about the structure of what is being created or s related to scale or contrast or putting things next to each other that are <coughs> make us think about contrast and uh, <coughs> those things have little to do with story and all about maybe something a, a lot more abstract mm -hmm. and so uh, let's look at another Sure, image. let's move on to the next. Okay. Wow. So uh, this is an image by Randy O'Brien. And Randy is, the ne actually the next two images that I have to show you, this one and the next, are from former graduate students and that have gone on and are teaching and are really um, having quite successful careers of their own. And so the cycle continues, mm -hmm. right, student to teacher. And uh, so Randy O'Brien, she now is uh, teaching at MSU Billings. Yeah. And she uh, is a ceramicist. And it was kind of interesting that this was a good segue, that the last conversation, it's a good segue to Randy's work because this particular body of work is exploring kind of fables or, and uh, here she has a, a ceramic donkey on one of those, the, the old machines where you'd put a quarter and you'd get on the toy horse and did you would ride it. Did this actually function? It did actually function. Wow. But, um, but of course, we didn't want children, you know, or anybody to get on top of it. Right. But it did function. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so she's making the comment of, you know, the, sort of the donkey and as the beast of burden and, and just for our perhaps human use and human amusement. And all of her work had this incredible surface on the, the ceramics. It also... Um, what a, what, how did she achieve that? Just through different atmospheric firing and hmm. some wood fired, some of her... Uh, uh, gl not, she didn't use a glaze, but a type of a stain and huh. Tara's sigillata. I'm not real sure about all the ceramic processes, but... Uh, she actually filled the entire space in the Gallery of Visual Arts, and it was just a really, really powerful show. She is still doing work similar using animal imagery and uh, speaking of metaphor. Yeah. And I believe you, and she was just in a show that you were in yeah. recently, yeah. too. So. Yeah, I was really flattered about that. Uh, she has. Uh, like in that piece, because I didn't see that piece, um, she has a really non-traditional approach to ceramics in that she's incorporated this motor and a, a uh, which I guess this would be considered a found object and, yeah. and uh, you know, the ceramics being uh, placed on it. And so I wonder how uh, she was supported by the ceramics community who, who can be uh, pretty hardcore about just ceramic. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. They can be purists, so yeah, to speak. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. what's really interesting is that the way she approached the, the actual ceramic isn't from a very purist standpoint. Right. It's very natural coloring. Yeah. She's not using bright, poppy 
glazes yeah. or or cold finishes, as they like to say, which is really just paint or some right. other kind of material rather than a glazing or firing process. But the combination with that 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 found object bright red is in true contrast. Yeah. But here again, it's the content, yeah. the content that's being communicated. And yes, um, it was it was received well. I mean, I don't believe that there are really the strong categories anymore mm -hmm. with artists. Mm -hmm. Everything is open mm -hmm. and so many people use all kinds of materials and mixed media and processes and it's all about what's the best thing to use to it, it express your to idea. Yeah, to yeah. achieve your yeah, goals. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so it's, I really like that, that supposedly we are all becoming more multidisciplinary mm -hmm. and we don't have to be categorized in mm -hmm. a set media anymore. Hmm. Great. So, so let, you have another one Yeah, I do. Let's, let's move to my last image okay. here. Okay. So uh, this is an image by Kensuke Yamada. <laughs> And this is also from his thesis show, which was, gosh, about eight years ago, I think. And Kensuke has, uh, these are life-size, large pieces. He uh, has really got a lot of recognition. He's done numerous residencies and one, of course, at our, our right here in Montana, the Archie Bray found out Foundation which is uh, world famous. And he's now currently teaching at the University of Arkansas. And he was also recognized as a um, Ceramics Monthly Emerging Artist a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. So uh, he's doing well, we love to see that. And uh, he has a really unique approach to his ceramics. Uh, the figurative aspect and then just the way he uses the color. Uh, he builds a lot on narrative of personal experience as well. And uh, just, I mean, he's very prolific. Yeah. And he actually came from Japan to study at U of L. Yes, he did. Okay. Yes, he did. So he brings that real strong tradition, of course, the ceramic tradition, and but more in a sense of the functional and the ritual mm -hmm. and push this to a really strong sculptural level uh, really did some amazing things with clay <laughs> well and i had the pleasure of uh, knowing and working with him a little mm -hmm. bit and one of the things that i will say about him is i think he was one of the most prolific artists i have ever met and uh and really working fast and having no <coughs> fear of scale. Right, And right. Uh, the way many other people would be very timid about it, he would jump right in. And, uh, it was fantastic that people come from so many different walks of life to attend school here at the University of Montana. You know, and that's, that's the wonderful thing about being an educator, but also as being a curator, there's so many things mm -hmm. I really enjoy about being a curator. And of course, you know, one is getting to work with so many different creative people. And it really expands my way of how I think about art. And it expands my way of how I think about art that I do, I'm an artist as well. And, mm -hmm. and so, th but of course, also the fact that you just get to, to reinterpret the art in a way mm -hmm. of the artist mm -hmm. that you put together too, so. Well, and, and I think it's really important uh, that students are exposed and immersed with working artists. And working artists are educators, or right. not like you touched mm -hmm. on it. They're natural educators. But it's critical that those educators be working. And uh, I've always had a great deal of respect for you continuing and working away in the studio all the time, all, all the while teaching. And uh, 
We're going to wrap it up today, yeah. and I just uh, wanted to thank you so much for coming on. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Fighting the good fight. <laughs> <laughs> Sharing um, with not only students, but the Missoula community and the Montana community um, the importance of art and the importance of really looking and appreciating art and spending time with art and imagery. So thanks for coming on today. Thank you. Look before you speak. <laughs> yeah.